participants to share any questions that they have um, so that we can uh, have our uh, participants um, uh, ask, uh, answer those questions. Um, so while we wait for those, I would um, ask one question to Christos, given this um, increasing importance on the um, companies that are driven by the digital economy and how does our um, system match their needs right now because of the conditions with the banking or our regulation and so on? I, what would be the priorities? We do see companies coming here we, we are involved and we know a lot of the operational issues that exist, but what else needs to be done from the perspective of really having an aligned system? Uh, Andrea, this is a very good question, I will say. And um, my view is that uh, because uh, doing business right now, um, previously uh, all these companies, they have a, a key driver with was tax. Now what the OECD says and all the countries around the world uh, is, Okay, you have a tax um, incentive to move on to another country, but this needs not to be your sole incentive or your only one incentive. So what we need to do here in Cyprus is that we need a holistic reform of our system uh, in order to provide uh, other incentives as well, in order for them to move here. Because if they are only motive to come here in Cyprus just tax, this motive will expire because the other countries, they will not respect your tax treaties. Mm. Uh, this is the, the new era. And if you pay zero tax, nobody will accept you. You need to pay some tax. So what you need to mention, what I need, what I, I need to say here is that um, the, the government needs to make a holistic review of how we do business in Cyprus. They need to make uh, simplicity of doing business in order to be able to attract the, those digital nomads. And uh, we have a lot of systems, like uh, I will say um, what uh, the US is doing in Silicon Valley, uh, what the Israelis are doing in uh, and attracting all these IPs and, and all this uh, young generation that they are doing um, um, all these digital uh, applications and gaming and so on. We don't need to invent the wheel in Cyprus. But we, we see the examples there, and this is what we need to do. Uh, if we do all this, I, I will say that our tax system, as it stands today, okay. is not bad. Is uh, I will say is on a good it's position not, because we, um, we uh, from time to time, we include tax incentives for people to come here. Yeah. It's not something that we don't do it. But I will say that after all these changes, we need to have a look at our tax system, make it more modern, but at the same time, we need to do our government sector more modern, we need to do our business line more modern, like the banks and so on. This is, I will say, it's a, a, an initiative that is not, um, fortunately or unfortunately, has to do only with tax. Uh, now the tax, if your tax is your sole motive, then you will not get any treaty benefit. You will not be respected yeah. by other countries. Yeah. This is problematic. I think since we're talking about tax, there is one question, Christo, that relates to DAC6. And uh, it is from Evgenia Stylianou. Question for Christo, what is your opinion on DAC6? Do you expect this yeah. heavy and complicated report will be effective in terms of tax avoidance? Uh, DAC6 is expected to assist on this. Uh, however, is okay. DAC six. We have experience from DAC six because it's similar to the DODAS in the UK. So the UK um, is already doing this. Uh, the issue is that it depends of how countries they will implement it. We have the problem now in Cyprus because the DAC six is actually uh, we are the um, we we have not ratified DAC six and we are the the last member staying of doing that. And I am embarrassed to saying this, but uh, still this is Cyprus. Someone said that uh, a couple of months before, but um, I will say that DAC6 will, um, will increase transparency. Uh, transparency is something that the EU and the OECD uh, uh, play um, a big role on that and are trying to do that. 
Um, I will say it, it will create more tax revenue to the tax advisor, and this will be um, a burden uh, to the taxpayers uh, in order to report all this. Mm. Um, I will say that the DAX6 is there to prevent tax avoidance rather than penalize it, because then uh, the taxpayers now will be uh, reluctant to make those schemes uh, because they will be reported. Um, now, if this is good or bad, uh, only time will tell mm. because now this is exchange. Whereas in the UK, this was exchange between the tax authorities and taxpayer. Now this will be exchanged within the EU. So the, the outcome will be different. This is one. And I'm pretty sure that with the DAC 6, a lot of taxpayers will maybe, will see that, uh, they will claim that they are, um, uh, their rights are uh, infringed and we're going to see a lot of uh, tax litigations in this respect. Um, so those are their tax lawyers. I feel that uh, they will have uh, work to do on that. I will say tax easy, it will give more jobs rather than tax avoidance, I would say. Okay. Uh, I don't know if anybody has any comments to share on this uh, question um, from the uh, other participants. Um, are there any other questions with, to the participants? And if not, maybe Eleni can uh, uh, close our session. Uh, although we are very close to running out of time, I would, since our discussion um, uh, has been about this Article 44, of the agreement and Professor Bovis had taken the position that there is some room left mm. for Cyprus authorities and business associations and professional bodies to go seek for bilateral agreements within the year, uh, privileged bilateral agreements before the, the whole thing is uh, wrapped up and harmonized at the EU level. Um, but uh, our Cyprus uh, speakers did not meet him on this point. I think it's important for, to give the floor just for one or two minutes to Chris to, to expand a bit further on this mm -hmm. on, from his point of view. Thank you, Aline. <laughs> It's an opportunity to do something which is innovative and, and uh, provocative in terms of understanding how an unprecedented scenario, such as leaving the European Union from a member state point of view, can realize potential benefit from the marketplace, which is the individuals, the service providers. We agree that uh, whatever we have in front of us as a TCA, as a trade and cooperation agreement is a Spartan skeleton of trading goods and customs. Of course, nothing is new there because the world is moving towards a, a zero tariff, custom free way of doing business and emphasis is based on non-tariff barrier, which is exactly what they, they discover now in the UK about how much it will take you to cross the, 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 the border between Northern Ireland and Ireland, and also the, the, the ferry crossing between the France, Holland, and, and the UK. The ability of having non-tariff barriers eliminated, they're having a serious issue understanding how costly, how ineffective, how uh, cumbersome the way is for trade, even if there is allegedly no taxes paid on goods coming in and out of the UK and EU vice versa. They consume about that. They consume about that concept there and they left the entire panoply of negotiating propositions for the services. One option is that the European Union will recommend member states not to break ranks and move away from that principle of one stop shop European Union versus the UK for the service agreement. And they tried to play very hard. Two days ago, the governor of the Bank of England 
declared an open war with the European Commission for the passporting right of financial services. And they try more or less to say that having a second seat or a subsidiary in the European capitals for financial services, banks and insurances, it's more or less not good for doing the passporting services. In other words, they're up in arms in terms of how they're going to continue negotiations with the European Union on the bread and butter of growth in the UK for the last 40 years, which is financial services. On our topic today, which is amongst other things, of course, it's professional qualifications and service professions recognized to perform in different member states. Article 44 gives an opportunity. It's not the only opportunity. It gives one opportunity for bilateralism. Is that important? In my view, it is the most important aspect you have. You have half a door open. Before it closes, before somebody else from the European Union Commission's point of view comes and closes the door and says, bilateralism is moved away in favor of plurilateralism. That means the Commission decides on behalf of member states for mutual recognition for standards, minimum or maximum standards, or acceptance criteria for recognizing the previous experience for an auditor to perform audits and put public liability questions on the table. That's an opportunity for individual member states doing exactly that, doing exactly that point of at least creating the rapport and the cooperation to make sure that they won't get any surprises for accountants, auditors, any other profession that recognizes itself for performance of, uh, for example, engineering services, civil engineer, mechanical engineer that requires some sort of accreditation. Remember, I finished my uh, short uh, uh, speech about that divine intervention on the part of the European Union about accreditations and about these sort of recognitions of performance. Look at what we do in the educational sector. We provide degrees, we provide credits. What's credit? Credit is a recognized ability to perform certain capacity. You have a five module credit, 10 year model, 10, sorry, 10, 10 credit module mm -hmm. for postgraduate, undergraduate. That's not by government. Government doesn't do anything. It's the professional body. It's an organization, the peer review that recognizes that. 